I want to thank everyone who's already um, submitted questions. We have quite a few. The chat will be open. Um, I will try my best to monitor it and we will save the questions for the end. So the first part of this presentation will be introductions followed by about five questions, four questions maybe for the first group and then for the second group a different set of questions. I've encouraged though our panelists if they're very passionate about um, a question and they have a great answer to jump in and then we will save about 20 minutes to 30 minutes um, at the end of the evening for questions to address any questions you have. So with that, I'd like to start with introductions and the first person I have um, on my list is Walt Allen. Uh, welcome this evening. I'm uh, the director of the Rio Hondo Police Academy currently and uh, I'm a graduate from the School of Environmental Design, which I graduated in 1975 uh, in uh, urban planning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Walt. Renita. I had to unmute. I was like, whoa. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Renita Bess. I am currently the head cheerleader at Southland Data Processing, which means I hold all the keys. I'm also called sometimes the president of the organization um, with Southland Data Processing. We are a privately held payroll company. I graduated from the College of Business with accounting major and um, it's in 1994, so it's pretty long ago. It's great to be here as well. Jonathan? Yeah, uh, Jonathan Farrar, and I guess my job title is ambassador, and I work in the uh, Office of the Inspector General at the State Department in Washington, D.C., and I graduated a long time ago with a degree in political science, 1978 to be exact. Thank you. Um, Donald? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Don Henry. Uh, I'm retired, but I'm formerly the director of the California Department of Food and Agriculture and also worked uh, as a uh, U.S. Customs Officer. And I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology in 1971. Thank you. Amarani? Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Amirani. My current position is a success coach at a community college and I'm pursuing my master's right now to be a school counselor. And um, I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona in 2014 under the business, College of Business in Marketing and I also minored in fashion merchandising. So it's definitely a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, second group, um, Brenda. Hi, I'm Brenda, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you this evening. Um, what a great opportunity for all of us. Um, I'm the Assistant CEO and Human Resources Director for the County of Riverside. And I had a, have a degree in political science. I got that degree in 1980. And um, I also went on to do law, so I happen to be a licensed attorney as well. So um, we're looking forward to your questions. Dean? Hello, Dean Bowie. I am a Senior Vice President of Product Strategies at City National. I graduated from Cal Poly the first time in uh, 2001 with a marketing management uh, degree, and then again in 2007 with, with an MBA degree. It's good to be here with you. Hansini? Hi everyone, I'm Hansini Vitarnage. I graduated uh, with my master's in biology in 2018. I did my bachelor's in microbiology also at Cal Poly, graduated in 2016. I'm currently a scientist at uh, Gilead Sciences, um, a pharmaceutical company. So um, I'm excited to be here and um, sharing my experience with you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, my name is Tracy Young. I currently work at Cal Poly Pomona. I work in the College of Environmental Design as the Administrative Support Assistant. Um, I graduated from Cal Poly in 2019 with a Master's in Public Administration um, from the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. And I got my Bachelor's from UC San Diego in Economics, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. John Poli. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Poli. 
I'm the contracts manager for goods and services for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California in Los Angeles. Uh, I graduated from Cal Poly uh, political science and minor in management and human resources in 92 and a master's degree in public administration from Cal State San Bernardino in 2006. Pleasure to be here and look forward to helping answer all your questions. Well, with that, let's get started. Um, the first question I'm gonna throw out there for the first group is, how do you find work or an internship during quarantine? Um, just, just jump in if- Jump in, sure. We're all um, friends. Okay, this is uh, Don Henry. Um, my suggestions uh, to the participants would be uh, under the unusual situation that we're working under now with the COVID-19 uh, uh, restrictions is just go online and just, you know, whether it's state, county, federal, uh, private industry, and just hit websites, um, talk to people that you know that may have jobs uh, uh, that are working in locations and uh, get uh, website ad addresses from uh, placement centers. Uh, and this is a very unusual time for people looking for work. And uh, so I think it's just a matter of being as creative as possible, but you just have to just keep plugging away at it day after day after day. Yeah, it's almost like treating it as a job, but, uh, and going on Indeed, uh, Monster, there, there's other job boards out there for uh, candidates that you can look at for the profession that you want to be in or the career or uh, job placement. Um, I know, you know, with being, if you're not working right now, there's no income coming in to be able to pay for some of these services, but there are opportunities out there that give you free, um, free uh, ways to, to, put your, to put your resume and cover letter on their site. So look for those opportunities and just every day plug away at it as, as Don has said for you know one or two hours and then take a break and then um, you know work your network your LinkedIn network even Facebook um, you know everyone's kind of in this thing together and so there's people out there that may have opportunities that you don't know about but if you just um, let them know that you're available and some of your the skill set that you have I think that um, looking at your network and letting them know what you do or what you can do um, gives extends your reach a little bit. And I would say uh, above all, be assertive, be aggressive. Uh, don't sit around, just get out there and do it. Thank you. I also wanted to just add for the alumni who are on this call tonight, um, something that happened just as a few as of a few months ago. If you're looking for a job, the Career Center currently has waived the fee for alumni to search through Handshake. So you can contact the Career Center on campus and for free, you could access their job board as well. And that goes for students too. Obviously it's free to students, but normally for alumni, there's a fee. So during this unprecedented time, they've um, made that change. So any other responses before I move on to question two? Melissa, yeah. I'm on group two, but could I please switch in? We would love that. Please do. Okay. Thank you. Um, I work in HR in Riverside County, so it's a very large operation. And I'm going to submit to you all that um, much of what we do during COVID is no different than what we do when there was no COVID. Most everything is online these days, whether it's private or public sector. And you, you're going to need to do what was already suggested, get on those search boxes like Indeed and, and there's a, a number of others, but also go straight to the employer because they're going to have a um, similar site there where they're going to list all their jobs and you need to basically stop those sites and, and go in there daily. But then to distinguish yourself, you might want to find out which department you're interested in working in and applying for and send an email into that person to let them know that you have a high level of interest. You'd love to have a little moment to chat with them about what the job would be and let them know that your application is in the pool already and that way they can look for you. So that's one way to distinguish yourself in a virtual world. And that would be true whether there's COVID or not COVID. I would recommend that both ways. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on to question number two. How do you leave a good paying job with good benefits for a job in the career you want to get into if you can only find lower paying entry level jobs that require more experience than you have? I think that's going to be different for every individual, right? And and it's a risk risk reward assessment. Um, if you're passionate about where you're at, well, you wouldn't be asking that question if you were passionate about where you're at. But to me, it, it's a risk and reward. Are you willing to take that opportunity, knowing that you're going to have to start from the bottom up and prove that you have the skill set and that you're a great team player within an organization? And, and be able to show them because um, every organization is different and they develop teams or, or move teams up to certain levels in, in different speeds. And so if you're willing to take the risk and you have your financial um, budgeting in place where you know you have a certain amount of savings that you're willing to take on that risk, then I would say make that jump. But if you're you know at a point in your life where you don't wanna take that risk, you know, you sometimes um, the path that you choose is not always the path that you wanted, but it's chosen for you, but you always have an option. And I think that's one of the great things about life is that you have a power of choice and, and you can make those choices based on the rewards that, um, that you get and the risk. So there's always a consequence to every sing single decision, but there's also great rewards and every decision we make, if it's the right path for you. I don't really have an answer, but that would be my advice in that question, for that question. Hey, so Dean here, if I may add, uh, and to add to what you said, I was in that situation five years ago. I was in a very good position uh, with another bank, but I got to the point I felt that I was being pigeonholed. I wasn't going anywhere. Um, so either stay there and, be stuck or take a chance. And I stepped down a couple of levels down and began uh, elsewhere, start elsewhere. But I know why I wanted to get from the new assignment and put my heart and soul into it. And so f five years later, here I am today with a whole new set of experience, a uh, whole new set of team to lead and doing new and exciting things that I was, that was missing in my career that I was craving which is the, uh, the autonomy, the, the challenge of the job, the flexibility to you know, use my brain and come up with new ideas and not being, you know, try to fit into a, a, put into a corner because I didn't conform to the direction of the company. But I think, I, I'm glad you said that, is you have to know what you want to get out of this decision and know the risk and reward uh, because it's gonna be a big change, not just for you, but you have a family who depends on you. That's how it so affects them as well. So it's gonna be a very calculated risk and you have to really put your heart and mind into it uh, because otherwise you wouldn't throw away what you already accomplished up to this point and start over. And you mean, if you don't, uh, are not committed to it, you just waste a, a good opportunity. Yeah, this is Jonathan Farrar. I just wanted to say that sometimes you, you just have to take the leap. No, it requires you to, to make a leap. I, when I joined the State Department, I started out at the bottom. And my wife had to leave her job in California to, for us to move to Washington. And she left a job that paid more than I did at starting out at the bottom of the State Department. So sometimes you have to really make a decision and pick it as a family to, to move forward on what, on what you think is really important. I yeah, this, also this is John Henry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I also wanted to add to my colleagues, you know, I see this as um, something that is normal to be able to um, leave a good paying job to then pursue something else. Um, I, along with my colleagues, I faced this in 2016, where I was in the fashion industry for seven years, and then, you know, the satisfaction of trying to pursue something different. Um, so what I would suggest, of course, is to make it tangible, make it where you do a to-do list so that you're accountable for those courses of action. Um, because once we have it tangible in a paper, we're able to dictate, okay, this is step one, this is step two. And you're building that experience with those entry-level positions. So 
I say it's like a sacrifice where if we are pursuing those entry level positions, you want to be able to reach out and see your list and saying like, okay, how is this progressing within like my overall um, outcome of this experience? So we want to definitely see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Don Henry. Uh, I was in that uh, same position back in, I hate to say this, 1973. And I was working at a hospital there in Pomona. And I got offered a job as a scientist for the uh, California Department of Agriculture at about the same salary, just slightly less than what I was making at the hospital. And I did have to go through those steps that other people have talked about, weighing, you know, it's kind of a risk benefit analysis type uh, process. And uh, I took a look at the benefits, the staff, you know, the benefits at the state versus the benefits at the hospital, and they were definitely better. And it was just a matter of relocating uh, myself and my wife and daughter from Pomona to uh, Sacramento. And, uh, but, but the whole thing is it's a risk, and sometimes you just have to take the risk and, uh, and you know, make the best of it and move on. I uh, will say that uh, you want to do something you like doing. I, I was a city planner for a year, and I changed careers. I became a police officer, virtually starting all over again. But I, I would wind up having a, a wonderful 45-year career in the profession, working at the executive level. Uh, the benefit was that I took the skills that I learned at Cal Poly, the critical thinking skills, the learning by doing skills. And I use those skills to, to excel uh, from the education I got at Cal Poly. So try to do what you uh, really want to do and something that you will really enjoy. Don't get stuck in an occupation that you're unhappy in. Do, do what you want to do, something that's going to make you happy in your career. Mm -hmm. I'll second that, Walt. That's uh, well said. And to, just to share with the group, and I think you've heard this as well, uh, I transitioned from private industry to the public side. And so to share with the group, um, you can make any transition if your uh, heart is in it and you've uh, thought about it. Really follow what makes you happy. And when you look at the um, career path and you focus on benefits, um, take everything into account, it, you know, uh, not just uh, your salary, but what that offers you, your family, uh, in terms of peace of mind. Uh, and I think that you'll find that no matter what you do, if you're happy doing it, you'll enjoy it and you'll have a great career. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to move on to question number three. When trying to expand your network on LinkedIn, what tips do you have for establishing a connection with someone you haven't met that works at a company you desire to work at? Okay, I'll, I'll start again. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, most often you have like secondary, third, you know, uh, connections, right? So for me, one of the key things into breaking through it is really providing um, content or information that may be relatable. Um, and so trying to even just be assertive and, and ask for that connection. Most people will connect with you. And so for you to be seen or for you to get recognized or your name, because you are now your own brand and developing your brand. So making sure that if you're trying to get recognition so that you, they can see that when you send your resume in that, that your name is now something they've seen over and over. So it's almost like a drip marketing campaign of your brand. So Renita Bess and, and if it's Walt or John or, um, a brand that I want to connect with, you know, I'll ask for the connection and then maybe, you know, send them something that if you can see any of the interest or the, the things that they have within their LinkedIn profile, um, giving them a little bit of a, a link to maybe an article that can, that they can relate to or something that they're passionate about. Um, sending them those types of link or, or just um, providing benefits to them and speaking to what they're passionate about 
is a way that you can develop those connections and creating that online um, type of a relationship because it's hard. You can't just drop in and, and visit, you know, the person that's um, at their office or, you know, at their building to, to show them who you are, but creating content or brand marketing for yourself that talks about you, but also providing a benefit for, for the person that you're trying to connect with. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Anybody else have some LinkedIn advice to share? Um, let me give us take a stab at it if that's okay. Um, I found that when people send a little note with their request to connect and they tell you why they're interested in connecting with you, for instance, you work in public sector, Brenda, and I'm really interested in moving from private to public and would like some tips as to how to do that or maybe connected to people that can sort of talk you through what some of the pros and cons are of moving to public sector. You're more likely to say, okay, I could zero in on that person because I know why they're connecting with me. It feels less random. The other is, um, you know, let's say you get connected on LinkedIn, asking for advice, asking for a moment when maybe you share coffee in a Zoom conversation or a conference call, can be very, very powerful because people are flattered that you would look for their advice and they might be willing to carve out that time. You know, be prepared for some no's as well. So don't get offended or hurt or dissuaded if some people aren't available to talk to you, but it never hurts to try. And I always look at no, this, everything is this way. I'm, if I don't try, I'm always going to stay right where I'm at. If I do try, I have a greater chance of moving forward in some way with some new connection. So even if they turn me down, I'm exactly where I am right now. And I, I lose nothing. And I gain some skills and some strength to be able to ask these kinds of questions of others. So it really, it, it's worth the effort regardless of how it goes. Great. Beautiful, Brenda. That was great. <laughs> Any other advice for, um, for LinkedIn? All right. As a job hunter, how can I break through the wall of applying online? Well, I can speak to how the uh, State Department, at least that part of the federal government works. When you're applying online, my strong impression is the first cut is made by a computer program. So you want to make sure that your application repeats back all the key words out of the job application or you'll never make it to stage two. John, did you? Yeah, I'll uh, second that. I'll, yeah, I'll second that. Uh, this is Don Henry. With the state of California, they're, you know, they've, they've moved to online filing, application filing. Most of the counties have too. And, and you have to make sure that you read the job specifications and you Answer, answer all the questions on the application, but like uh, like the fellow before me said, get all the, the key words in the job specs uh, somewhere in the application if you have the opportunity, uh, because I don't really think the state uses computers to screen them, but uh, it won't be long before they do, and, uh, and then just hope for the best on that one. I was gonna ask that, is that because the state department and the federal government is looking, using bots, right? the bots as far as, as the technology to weed out those that maybe are not eligible for the position. Um, it's also a matter of how many people are applying. Exactly. You know, um, even with that, you still end yeah. up with 100 applications. Hmm. And uh, from a public safety standpoint, if you're coming into the public safety arena in California, if you get to the point where you're filling out what's called a personal history statement, you cannot omit anything. You have to fill the application out completely and honestly, because that's going to be the first form of disqualification uh, for public safety uh, related jobs. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. And especially if the job requires any type of a security clearance, uh, either for law enforcement or, or whatever. Yeah, you have to answer everything honestly. No, don't, don't forget any Traffic file, well, traffic violations won't matter, but um, I, I did work for the federal government for Department of Homeland Security for seven years as a customs officer. And 
they the they do screen the initial applications coming in for completeness and they get and they get thousands of thousands of applications a month and if an application is incomplete it just gets kicked out automatically okay. and then the complete ones are passed on uh, and, and I don't know whether HR back in Washington for Homeland Security has any other screening things other than everything has to be answered. So, so when I, I'm in the private industry, so um, for for us, you know, what's um, becoming pretty prevalent is like video, sending a video, like a short video, not like a five minute video, because our attention span is very short. But that's one way you can break um, through the wall when it's on online is send your resume in and then be assertive and, and call and leave messages, even if the HR department, because um, especially if you want that job, right? Assertiveness and the, the hungry, the hunger to, to be seen and to, to be um, um, considered for the position, I think plays a huge part in whether or not your your resume or you're going to be called for um for an interview so just sending it in and expecting if, if a, a private company is looking at a hundred applications just sending in one and then hoping that you're going to get a call you know send a, a video that talks about yourself um so that they can see your your um assertiveness how fun and enthusiastic you are and what a great te great team member you would you would be and then leaving a call and saying, just checking in to see if you've received my resume. I'm really interested in having an opportunity to talk to you and let you know why I would be a good fit for your organization. I think it's, it's a, a, a great way to show that you're taking the initiative and, and hungry for an opportunity to be a part of the organization. Great. John, did you have your hand up or were you gonna mention something? John Poley? Originally, I was, it was already said, and great advice. Um, I often find with online applications that they haven't spent enough time reading the job description. Um, so they may even get through uh, the first phase, which is showing general qualifications. But as they begin to be vetted, and I think someone mentioned sometimes it's well over 100 applications, um, simple things like just not paying attention to the job description. Or um, it should go, um, shouldn't go without saying, um, research the company that you're also applying for. You can learn so much and then tailor your um, application and resume um, to better fit the, the job you're applying for and the organization. Great. I know we talked about maybe saving um, questions in the chat to the very end, but a question came through that I think is applicable to this topic and it's from Aurora Williamson and it is, when looking at applications, sometimes they say something along the lines of, this is a paid based on qualifications and experience of those accepted. How can you tactfully ask and, nego and or negotiate? When do you call after you send the application? So there's two parts to that, two important parts. I was just responding to that, Melissa. Uh, it's a great question. It, it is. Uh, I would share that I find the, the best time or maybe the most opportune time to ask to negotiate is once you've been offered the position. Again, it, um, I think when they uh, will state in the job application that it's based on qualifications, if you're given the opportunity to interview and you wow the, uh, the hiring manager, um, when they offer you the job, that, that's probably one of the best times to negotiate. Um, and uh, you'll have a good feel on where things are going um, so that when you offer your negotiation um, a better opportunity to get what you're what you're looking for. Great. And uh, uh, this is Don Henry. Yeah. I would concur with that too. Yeah. And uh, I, I worked in private industry for a couple of years. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, Don. Go ahead. I'll finish after you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, in, in, in private industry that I work for, we um, uh, once with the salary issue or, or, or salary issue benefits issue was was usually not discussed until uh, we had either the, the person we we were we really wanted or three one of three and then it, and then when you hit the second round then when that's when yearly you can talk about benefits and, and salary 
and uh, and that's usually about the time that that the company is going to have some idea in their mind what they're what they're willing to pay. So my suggestion would be just be patient, and if you make the final round, then that's the time to to ask about you know benefits, and if it's not already spelled out in the job application. So and whether that's a full-time employee or a contact contract employee, however, they're, whatever the company's going to you know going to proceed with. So. That would be my suggestion on that. Um, if I can chime in on the um, on the question, so sometimes you can uh, research online um, what are what is the pay for similar positions on other companies and also the company applying. So sometimes there are people actually input the actual salaries, um, benefits, things like that. So when you negotiate or even you prepare to negotiate, so you have better understanding so you probably won't ask too much or maybe too less so that's also a good thing to do before you actually start negotiating hey speaking of negotiation hey, brenda from the hr perspective it is illegal for them to ask you of your current or salary history correct yes so, yes it is right so You're for right. the young professionals uh, be aware of that that this, they cannot ask you about your current or uh, uh, salary history um the other thing uh, um it was already stated go online and check but a, a really fun fact for everybody that's looking to go in the public sector we have transparent california so all higher level positions are posted at the state website and they're posted at the um, public agencies website the other is all jobs that most public agencies have are included on their website with the the position, the starting pay, the top pay, and sometimes there's some benefit information as well. So you can find all of that out on your own just by doing a, a few clicks on their website. So I would recommend doing that because even in public, we'll say that will place you on the range commensurate with your experience. But then at least you know what the start of that range is, what the top of the range is, and if you feel like you're at a place in your career where you should be at least in the middle, you know what the middle is, so you know what to ask for. Renita, did you want to add anything? Oh, no, um, it was covered. It's good. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm going to make sure I want to make sure our second group has um, some opportunities to answer questions and group one, please feel free to jump in if a question resonates with you and you feel comfortable. Um, like I said, we're all friends. So the first question for um, the second portion is what advice would you give to someone trying to figure out what career would be a good fit for them if they don't see one with their particular skill set or passion. Uh, Dina, I'll go first. So when I began my career, uh, I jumped all over the place. I was in operations. I was on the front line. I was in risk management. Then I ended up in marketing. So um, by trying out different things, I came to a spot where I found I am most passionate about, where I can uh, really enjoy my job. And I did that because I volunteered for different assignments across the organization. So for those who for those who are starting out in a company, uh, don't just focus on your current job. Look for opportunities to volunteer for different projects, different assignments. So it gives you the exposure to try different things, uh, and, and you know, you will find a, a, a career path that is totally different than what you uh, start uh, with. And you wouldn't know until you volunteer, and then you they wouldn't know if you are interested until you volunteer your hand and say, you know. I mean, marketing, but you know, this is, sounds interesting. I'm interested, you know, let me help you. And, and so that's how you open doors and you learn the experience and ultimately, you know, find a career that really suits you, right? your, your values, your, your goals in life, your passion, and it's perhaps even beyond uh, the pay. It's w what you are very passionate about, what you find uh, fulfillment. So uh, that's how I started and it works for me. I hope everyone really takes to heart what Dean just mentioned, that that's so true. And to give an example, I started out of high school, or I should say when I started at Cal Poly, I worked for a big box retailer similar to Home Depot, unloading Christmas trees, uh, you know, getting sap all over my clothes and 
I found that by trying new things with that organization, uh, 15 years later, uh, I had moved up through the chain to kind of a junior executive position as a merchant, uh, purchasing products from around the world. And uh, so again, I can't say enough, sometimes um, be mindful not to always worry about the next best job, but appreciate uh, the jobs and the different jobs that you have and look for the potential. And, and again, relating to your education at Cal Poly, uh, you will have the basics to handle almost anything um, that uh, you will find in, in your career, so. Um, I can offer a little bit here. Um, like the others, I started out in um, in college. I started out at San Bernardino County, and they had us train in every division of the HR operation, and I kind of accidentally landed in HR, and it turned out to be something that has become a lifelong profession in one form or another. Um, but what I did once I started getting onward in, in the profession is I tried out different things. I would volunteer for things like I wanted to work with unions. I wanted to know what that was about because I figured if I go into law someday, I should know how that works. So next thing you know, I volunteered and I'm taking notes at bargaining table. And you might say, well, that's a very unglamorous job, but it's actually quite cool because you're nobody yelling at you specifically but you get to be there and hear and see how the sausage is made to get a new labor agreement with a union. Um, you have access to the CEO because you're the one that's taking all the notes. And he called me in one day and said, hey, I wanna take a look at your notes to see what's going on. So up I trot with my notes and next thing you know, he's going, wow, these are really detailed and I really have a good picture of what's going on. But the important piece is I got to then see even higher into the organization, is that something I could see myself doing someday? Um, the other is I did jobs that I wasn't qualified for. Um, I did that quite a lot. And I would figure I learned my way through college and I learned my way through all the other jobs I ever took. So I figured I'd, I'd figure this one out too, and I did. And so having that in your pocket, that thought that I can do this, even though I don't know everything about it today, um, I see a lot of people talking themselves out of jobs, especially women, because they seem to think that they need to know every detail of that next step. And I would encourage you to take the next step and then do what you're really good at, which is you can learn everything that you're going to need to know. Men do this more regularly. They'll take a job that they have maybe the same experience as the woman who's turning down the even the interview because they're afraid that they're not ready yet. But you're never ready for that next job and, and, unless you try it on. And so I tried on a lot of different work by volunteering and filling in when people were out sick and taking on projects when the law changed and nobody wanted to dig through the, the details of that new law. And, and everything ended up pushing me further up the ladder really, really quickly, may I add. And that was something that I owned just by being curious and raising my hand a lot saying, hey, I'll do it. You know, whatever it is, I'll do it. And next thing you know, um, I'm in the room with the CEO and I'm 26 years old and going, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here, but apparently I am. So I'm just going to go with it. And he's asking me questions, so I guess I'm allowed to talk out loud and answer. So um, you, just, you just kind of play it by ear. And a lot of life and a lot of your career is going to be like that. It's not going to be as, as measured and as scheduled as you might imagine it could be. That's not how it rolls. So be open to stuff that just kind of flows in front of you. And I call it conveyor belt. It goes by, at least pick it up, look at it, see if that's something you're even interested in. If not, put it back and let it go by. But if it's something that you're kind of thinking, this is kind of cool, maybe I should check a little further, hang on to it and pursue it. So don't rule yourself out of your own future. Brenda, that is a great analogy. And, and for me, uh, once I got comfortable in a position, in the job, it, to me, it was time to move on. Uh, to move up the ladder. So once you get comfortable uh, and things get easy, it's time to challenge yourself. That's, that's the only way you're going to grow. So Right. So I love, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here and, and, you know, I'm part of the panel, but I'm like, 
man, Brenda's getting me excited. I need to move out of my comfort zone and <laughs> pick up something and try it. No, she, she speaks. I mean, that's just a wealth of knowledge. And for those that are listening that are brand new to the workforce or entering the workforce or, 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 or have, been, have graduated a long time ago, it's that energy that you want from people that are always hungry, taking initiative, is resourceful. All of those things that Brenda um, exhibited with her path, I think it, it's a great uh, way to shape your character, to develop who you are, to gain more skills and knowledge. So Brenda, thanks for that exciting um, share there. I, I was really um, motivated. It's very motivating. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank actually Brenda and Walter. I'm also new to my job. I, I will be completing two years um, in December. So I learned a lot from you, like you both, when you said, you know, when you get com too comfortable, that means it's time to try something else. So yeah, and also one thing I learned uh, uh, when I joined the company, uh, I, that was, this is my first industry job actually after graduation. So in my team, I was the only girl. So <laughs> when I go to meetings and um, sometimes in the beginning I was scared, but you know, I learned how to speak up. And uh, whenever I, I was given a project, I always say, yes, I can do it. Even though I have no clue, but you know, I always trust myself. I can, um, you know, get the project and I can handle it. You know, I will learn along the way. But so that was something I was uh, appreciated by everyone in my, uh, team that I always say yes even though it's a little bit hard but I will you know go in the weekends I'll finish it you know work overnight you know just finish it somehow so yeah <laughs> one of the things also with employers is they're invested in you and so they want they want to encourage you to succeed right they're gonna invest in in your success so um, what was just said was for to make sure that even if you don't know asking questions is, is not off the table. I mean, I think the, there's never really a dumb question, right? There are some people that will react to it like that, but for the most part, don't be scared if you don't know to ask the questions. And like Brenda said uh, earlier, you know, it's, um, it, it kind of does edify the other person when you're like, hey, let me get some advice from you because of your experience and where you're at. Um, it makes them feel good when you're, when you're seeking questions that, kind of help you along the way. So be be hungry and, and, and be curious about things, whether it's looking for a new job, just, you know, put yourself out there. And one, one point to consider too is why you should increase your knowledge and experience within the company, especially time like COVID. Within my industry, for example, in the banking industry, there is going to be layoffs. Right? We're, we're right sizing, we're gonna uh, downsize next year so as the leadership team looks at the people on their team and decide who to keep and who to cut right. we're gonna look at those that we can have that have more experience can do more that can add more to the team those are the ones that we want to retain those that just do what they've been hired to do nothing more nothing less we can say what we can do without because we have Walt here who can do his job plus uh, Dean's job. So we can keep Walt and let you know, Dean go. Right. So it's more than just that, but also thinking for your career longevity is always to your benefit to be able to offer more to the company, have more experience, have that can do attitude that that yeah, I'm not afraid of failing. Right? I'm not afraid of throwing my sleeves. I give my best at it. At least I try. Those are the ones that when as a you know, leadership team will look at who to keep and who to let go. We also consider that as well. Um, I can jump in as well. So similar to what was mentioned before about um, about volunteering, I would also recommend doing informational interview. Maybe before you even start volunteering, and areas that you're remotely interested in and um, do an informational interview with them. It could be 30 minutes of saying, hey, what do you do in your job? 
oh, what's a day, what's a week uh, in your job like? Can you imagine yourself doing it? If you are really, if you imagine yourself there, then say, hey, can I volunteer? Um, I have heard cases where you can actually even create your own job. If you see a problem in the situation and you realize, hey, what if we do this and this and you propose it, they can actually create a job to fit um, your situation and your solution. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there because informational interviews are really helpful, especially given the current situation, the pandemic, it's pretty easy. You just go on a Zoom and do a 30 minute session and you realize, can you imagine yourself doing that? Can you imagine yourself pursuing that before you go into volunteering or any of that? I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Um, the next question I would like to ask you is, how do you continuously improve outside of the workforce? One of the things, Melissa, oh, go ahead, Don. I don't have Don there. Melissa, I was gonna say, one of the things that, that has helped me is uh, continuing to um, build on my knowledge and skill set. So you know you have your grad you graduated from college, you move into your profession, and I'll, looking at uh, public procurement, for example, there are uh, professional certifications uh, that I often look for when interviewing or even looking at job applications. So outside of what I may learn or take advantage of in my organization, I'm also uh, going back to school, uh, going back and getting a master's, or going back and taking taking those professional certification classes that will help set me apart from um, other applicants for those types of uh, job opportunities that may come up. And I would say to everyone um, uh, that's listening, you know, your, your knowledge should never end. Um, you always want to continue to keep your skill set uh, um, at the very top. So. So along with what John stated, um, I do wanted to mention that, you know, sometimes we navigate to see where we can gain this professional development. So I would definitely suggest um, any associations in your field of study. Um, you would be very surprised that the amount of webinars that are now happening because of COVID um, and some of these are free. So go ahead and jump on that. The associations of a specific um, field of study and being able to attain that uh, professional development in that area. I, I have to say this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got my uh, uh, degree at Cal Poly over 40 years ago. And three years, three years ago, I went back to school to get my master's. So what I'm telling you, it's never too late to continue your education. Uh, Yes, go to get affiliated with those organizations that are related to your job. There's a lot of free uh, updates in terms of what you might be doing. Uh, but life should be a continue, continued learning process. So uh, continue to go to school if you can and continue to enhance your education and your critical thinking skills. If I may, I'd like to add, um, Joining things such as the board, you know, you, you participate as a member in an organization, but if you can get an active role where maybe you are doing the conference and you are one of the um, providers of the online training, um, because you do have something that you know that others don't already and you could train for that and you can volunteer. Um, I think being a member of a board or a committee of, you know, subset of a board where you're networking with people in your field and so you're getting the breadth of awareness of how other organizations do what you do, and you're gonna take that back to your work. Um, and, and I like to say this too, this is a little unconventional, but um, people sometimes refer to me as fearless, and, and I can assure you, I have sensible fears. Um, but I try things away from work that are really outside my comfort zone. And I do a lot of pushing out of comfort zone because you need to know how to do that both in your personal life and at work, if you're going to ever be different than you are right now. And, you know, for me, I'm afraid of height. I took up rock climbing. My daughter, who's not afraid of height, was very, you know, she had a lot of fun with me up there as I'm yelling, I'm done, I need to get down and having a little mini anxiety attack on the wall. And she's like, no, let her, make her stay, make her go. 
and I, you know, had to remind her that I could hear her say that about me. But what it did is it infused some fun, some stretch, but it gave me confidence about something that I didn't have. And that becomes a part of your brain activity. So as you go back to work and you're in a meeting and they give you some, you know, they throw something your way and I'm thinking if I could climb that rock this week and I got this. And so it puts you in a different brain space to feel open to trying new things and having confidence in yourself that you can be, um, be successful at various other things even though you haven't done it yet. Yeah, I just wanted to say out here in Washington, D.C., those professional certifications really open up a lot of doors. Uh, my wife is an IT security professional, and the certification in many cases is better even than, a, say, a master's degree. The other thing I would add is it's never too late to learn a foreign language, and you can even do it for free online, and learning another language opens up a lot of doors that may, may have been closed to you before. Anybody else? There's lots of great books out there. Um, if you like to read things that are like when they do it in parables, like Patrick Lencioni is a great author. There's great books for self-development on how to be a great, great tea player. Those all are soft skills we can all develop. So um, I think working on our own self-development is always important. You should always be uh, in the process of improving all the time. Um, and, and, and that's key to working in any organization is that they know that you're always about process improvement. So continuing, continuing to improve outside the workforce is, is all about reading and learning and then getting insight from like the, this ASI panel and asking those questions that can, you can receive golden nuggets that you can you know put in your arsenal of things to to have for the future so i think this is a great question and it, it's relatable whether it's for work or for your own personal life is self-development taking the time to really get to know yourself so there's um also assessments that you can take on who you are the myers-briggs you know to learn about more about yourself so you can understand your passion if you haven't read um the book by paul um, Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist. It's a great way to find your own personal legend and it gives you some best um, standards on how you can, you know, work through things. And so those are some great um, books that you can read. So Patrick Lencioni, um, Paulo Coelho, and, uh, you know, like the Dale Carnegie's, all of those great books you can read. Regarding finance, you have uh, Dave Ramsey, um, books, but also um, one of the Rich Dad Poor Dad is a great book to read for, for, for learning how to do finance. So all of those things that create a, a balance individual for you to be, become balanced in all areas, reading those types of books always help. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this is kind of a fun one. What are the emerging industries in the next one to two years that we should be looking at or looking into? What's on the horizon? It's not TikTok. No. <laughs> Thank goodness. Melissa, I don't know if this is an emerging industry, but I would say definitely um, supply chain and, and things that will continue to be um, surrounding supply chain. Uh, there's a lot of talk, especially during this pandemic, about uh, large organizations rethinking how much they send offshore as opposed to developing domestically. And again, I, I think that um, now that we're all working, I shouldn't say we're all working, with many people working from home and the increase in having things sent home to for home delivery, um, I think supply chain is going to be one of those areas to, to look at as well. Yeah, Melissa, this is Don Henry. Um, can I ask a question about the uh, the students that are listening in? Is, are they science background or are they across the board as far as their academic? Uh, Do this. Work? Raise your hand, students, and if there's some alumni on this call, if you are in um, the science field or industry or major. Yeah. 
So no. there's a few, I guess. Huh? No. There are not very many. No, not very many. Okay. Well, one thing to to pick up on on the, the last gentleman's uh, uh, topic about supply chain, and, and this is more on the science side of things, either agriculture, or biology, stuff like that. But supply chain is becoming a, a, a huge area for for anybody that's shipping product either domestically or internationally. And it's in in addition to just the the inventory of where do you what do you have and where is it and where is it in the system? What I'm beginning to see now, at least in some of the agricultural industry, is that companies and even growers and and uh, wholesale marketing and retail marketing are beginning to demand what they call now a track and trace system to be included into the supply chain. In other words, they want to know you have product X. What are all the raw materials that went into product X? What are quality assurances are there along the line and, and in transportation and that? And, and that is something that I had to learn about because it wasn't something that they had around when I was going to Cal Poly. But I see more and more of that in, in government and I see more and more, at least in this, the industries that have something to do with science, pharmaceuticals, um, that track and trace, even in the cannabis industry, uh, it's it's a requirement in some states to have a track and trace. So, if you can get any experience along those lines, uh, I, th I think that would be beneficial. And then I'll throw out a couple more. These are science, but nanotechnologies in in, in any of the science industries is is the next thing that's on the horizon. And then, of course, anything with genetics or DNA. Um, is getting to be more and more more and more important now how that spills over into into some of the other areas i don't know but those are my suggestions based on a science kind of a science backed uh, uh, career john posted on um, cybersecurity. i'm in the payroll industry and cybersecurity and fraud and all those things happen to be a hot topic um during covid you know renita uh, thank you for bringing that up. It's interesting. Um, I think I'm fortunate in Metropolitan, even though we're a public water utility, we really bridge so many different um, career paths. And we are currently working with the CFO's office to change the way we um, review wire transactions, mm -hmm. uh, as well as when we get requests to change pay to addresses. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Don mentioned track and trace. The cybersecurity world is also has their, has their own form of track and trace. Uh, we do this with software now, uh, where we will try and go all the way back to see where it's being developed and also where it's being managed. Is it being managed domestically? Um, you know, is, uh, who, who has their hands in that process? So it's, it's interesting how many of these are interco interconnected as well. Well, even as consumers, right, nowadays when people kind of back off when you're trying to buy something and they require PayPal, right? And, and instead of a credit card. And so then when I, whenever I look at a, a, a product that I want to buy, then I go looking for um, whether or not it's a valid site or a valid organization. I'll have to go Google and say, has, you know, is such and such organization uh, been a, a scam or is it, is it a valid organization? So it's similar to those things. And they'll give you a report. Well, it's only been two months old. And, and so that's where it comes in with the digital footprint. And so, yeah, definitely the digital world is um, an emerging kind of a um, career. So if you're in the business side or in CIS or um, even marketing people, you know, there, there's SEO. Um, with all of the, the marketing things that you can get involved in, website development, um, brand marketing, video editing, those types of things. Those are all um, things that are emerging now because everything is going to digital. So the digital environment, I think, is a, is a hot um, path, career path to go in. So for us on the banking side, the biggest thing for us is how to maximize the data, our customer data clean insight. And this is near and dear to my heart, being a marketer, I want to know as much about Bonita as possible so I can serve for, to her and offer at the right time in her life as she would accept it and not doing mass marketing. 
So there's tons of data about us available, but having that data scientist mentality of you know, taking the big data, dissect it and dissect it and dissect it to come to a, identify Melissa and say, Melissa, at this point in her life is a great candidate for a mortgage right? at 9, 10, 20, 20. So that's how can we get you know lots of data and you know cut it and slice it enough so we can monetize it. Uh, everybody's trying to do that in, besides bank, but that's a that's I think that's a new opportunity. And I think thinking about Kapali, I'm thinking about the MIS folks, uh, the, mm -hmm. M, the the computer science uh, you know, uh, students and programs. And we have a lot of those Kapali grads at, the, at my company as well. Right? That's what they do. Right? That's who I go to because they have the education in order to apply it in, in real business. And me as a marketer, right? I can tap into that, to the big data, to identify the Melissa, the Renita, and other people to, to uh, sell to. If I can piggyback off what Dean is talking about with the data analytics, um, in public sector, believe it or not, we are looking to apply data analytics, but it's been a very floundering experience at best for most. And so you need to have the, whoever is going to be providing the, the, the system pull of data needs to also understand the business side of the operation in order to know why they're pulling that data and, and what will be its value. You know, we can pull data off systems raw all day, every day, but it may not mean much in that state. So um, I need that marriage of, and, and public sector especially, but I'm sure private sector is already doing it and maybe beginning to do it as well, um, is how, what are our key performance indicators? How do we prove them with the data? What kind of systems do I need to have put in place that will properly accumulate and distribute, disperse that data through its reports that it, it's actually in a useful format and won't take a lot of staff time to drill down and create a spreadsheet or some other parallel um, report. And I've got a, it's not known, it's not very um, well used in HR yet, but I have a, a a data person, she's, they call it my secret IT person. That's, that's what people are calling it. But she comes in and works with all of my analysts. And when we put up new systems through IT, she works with all of them to say, so you have 180 forms that you want to put onto this, this system. How many of them do you really use? When were they created? And can you get rid of, say 150 of them. So we have 30 forms we walk over. Why would we need that many? So you need people that understand the business admin side of it, but also understand the system side of it to explain to the, the lay person who doesn't understand systems how to do that. So this, this whole data um, performance and applying it to improving company performance is, is a huge space right now. Um, I mentioned public health as well. Um, we have a lot of scientists working in the public health field right now, and they're getting a lot more prominence and visibility and hate mail. So they're getting all of it, but it's, it's critical mass to getting through these kinds of crises. And, and it's something that I think is exciting. I mean, if I, I kind of wish I were a, a scientist right now because I would love to be in there chasing down these sorts of things and figuring it out, but I'm not. And so I'm gonna leave that to the smarter brains that do that. But that's a really, really big area right now. But for, the, for just the general business world, we're looking at key performance indicators, the data to support it, and targeting and, and honing data in a proper way. And it's hard to find those key people. So if you can make yourself one of them, you are going to be a hot ticket on the market. So um, I hope some of you are like that and are listening and you can find your way into that. This is probably this is probably not going to relate to too many folks, but obviously in public safety, uh, there are going to be some changes occurring, massive changes. California is well ahead of the rest of the country in terms of peace officer selection and training. Uh, you can see some trends that are going to happen at a national level uh, through Congress, uh, and California is, is also involved in legislating certain uh, uh, measures. However, uh, from my perspective, there needs to be balance and, 
and and there's going to be a need for uh, major conversations with the involved parties. Uh, police officers are spending 40% of their time dealing with the homeless population in many of the cities. Uh, there are trends that officers uh, on uh, the ground level have not dealt with in the past. So the, uh, I project some major changes uh, with the delivery of public safety services uh, in, in the very near future. Um, I'd like to add to that in terms of uh, biotechnology pharmaceutical, I think uh, cell therapy is emerging industry. It's, it's, it's there, but you know, there's a lot more work to do in terms of treating solid tumors. So uh, there are a lot of companies out there trying to use cell therapy to treat solid tumors. So that might be uh, a good place to, um, you know, maybe think about and then, you know, maybe uh, have a skill set, uh, maybe related research if you're applying for uh, pharmaceutical company um, for job opportunities. Also, from my experience within our company, risk management is uh, something that they're trying to improve, especially with the uh, ongoing pandemic. So they're trying to improve the uh, workspace, um, our dining areas, like you know, everywhere, trying to maybe improve what we already have in terms of another pandemic or, you know, even for the flu season, that might be, you know, a good thing to manage risk associated with spreading germs, so. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else on the panel? So I have about two more questions and I wanna make sure we answer um, questions from our, our um, guests tonight. Um, it look, looks like I have one already in the chat. If there's any other questions, please at this time, take a moment and add it to the chat and I'll make sure that we get to that after um, the next question or two. So um, this is a, a good one that's come up a few times in some of our other events and it's in regard to virtual interviews. Um, virtual interviews are now the new norm. Any advice on body language or how to participate in an online or virtual interview? Don't do it from your car. <laughs> we just recently did an interview with someone and it was cutting in and out because they were, I, I don't know, I think they were trying to do it while they were driving. Don't do that. <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, not too much movement. I shared some tips from virtual selling that my team shared with me, right? So make sure you're in a space, dress like you would if you were um face to face with them at their office you know be presentable um don't make sudden movements with your hands don't talk too much with your hands uh, look look at the camera you know so that it looks like you're looking at them and that you're truly engaged in the conversation be prepared um uh, it's been said in by pat by the other panelists you know research the, the organization and see look at their culture and their values and 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 make comments about maybe like the team members you saw if they have team members on on their site about um you know whether or not you like you know their team um or what what you can the observations you make about the organization right don't don't do the typical um questions um that it, it's not that deep and or just kind of chit chat here and there, but really look at uh, the organization and ask insightful questions. And, and that would, you can get, gain those type of questions by looking at the organization and seeing what they're all about and, and kind of making observations, what you see online. So it's important. They talk about when you're on Zoom, you know, make sure you're not, um, your camera's not like this where you only see your eyes and that you have enough, you know, you're not always, you're not up like that. So you only, you know, it's, it's all even and, and um, creating a, an environment where it's uh, presentable. And if I think of any more, I'll, I'll chime in. Okay. Any other advice for those who've been doing um, virtual interviews? I, I would add, I, and I just finished a few and everyone understands that you, you're, You'll be, you could be um, nervous, but I would say it's okay to show personality. Uh, smile, 
Uh, and I think the interviewers will also want to know, you know, they're trying to get a feel for who you are as well. So again, all of the things Renita said are, are correct and um, plan ahead, dress appropriately, um, but it's okay to show personality and definitely um, smile, enjoy it. Great. And you know, I, it's you know, what I love when I do Zoom meetings is when they see something like in the background and they ask about it. It's like, oh, you know, if you can relate to like a picture that they have, or maybe it, they're like a Dodger fan or something. That's where John is saying about your personality, bringing that in and say, hey, I'm a Dodger fan too. And, you know, because I'll ask things like, what sport did you play in high school? And if they didn't, because, you know, team sports are important or things that you did outside of school is important to bring up. But if there are things that you can relate to with the interviewer, like a fishing, uh, maybe there's a fish on the wall or something, ask about that and, and really engage them. That will um, create an environment where it's not just about the transaction of the interview, but actually you're interested in the individual because that's how we engage our candidates is asking them about themselves. And so it's a two way conversation because you also have to make sure that you like the organization. So there's certain things about someone's background that talks that speaks to them and who they are. So engage them in those types of conversations. Yeah, for me, when I interview and I hired, I hired for fit first. So I think I'm glad you mentioned the personality being relatable. And it's more so important now to, uh, via Zoom because, you know, I'll be talking to you over Zoom for the foreseeable future. And if we don't click, you know, our one-on-ones or meetings will be you know, pretty dreadful. And I want someone I, I look forward to like, getting online in the morning and so I think during the interview is you know, let your personality shine, right? If you prepare for the, the, the meeting, you research the company, the job, the person that you're interviewing with, it's a conversation. It's not meant to be an interrogation. Right? So have that mindset in mind. You know, we want to hire you just as much as you want to work with us. So there's a, you know, we're, we're mutual partners. So once you establish that, it's an easy conversation. You know, and so they'd be comfortable, but more important is, especially this time is, we want to, we want to like the person we're talking to, uh, that we can relate, you know, and once we have that, I can train anyone for their job, I can groom them, I can coach them, but if their click is not there, it's not gonna be pleasant for either of us. And so, and the first impression goes a long, long way. I, I would follow up with um, Dean and offer that um, you want to make a conversation. I think that conversation piece is critical. And I've had interviewees, well, they'll say, yes, you know, did, have, did you do this? And then they'll wait for the follow up. But the, it's like they say yes and they're done. And then it's even more um, awkward over virtual than it is in, in a live interview. And so then we, we kind of go, okay. Can you tell us why you said yes? You know, instead of them saying yes, and this is why. You know, I did this and I did this and I did this, and they they have a whole follow up shtick, if you will, to support what they're answering. And we want you to come prepared with that follow up um, support for your answers, so that way we don't have to extract it out of you. Line, you know, and I'm I'm doing this, I'm pulling you through. And, and it makes it really uncomfortable for us as the interviewers because we're in pain for you. And we want you to do better. We, we were like, oh, please, please, next time, give us the whole answer. And then, you know, and we're all rooting for you. So help us help you by bringing more to say to the meeting and giving examples, you know. And so getting yourself, you know, in a, in a place where you've thought about what could they possibly ask me and then go, okay, here are some examples I'm gonna give, here's some fun facts. We'd like to be entertained a little bit, just like you would like to have a little levity in the conversation. Bring it with you, we would love to hear it. So, um, you know, yes is good, you know, that's good, but follow it up with the, the entire story of what that yes means. Yeah, I would just add that sometimes serendipity helps because our, 
Our daughter is convinced she got her first job at a law firm in Los Angeles because during the interview, which was virtual, her phone rang and she had a baseball themed ringtone. And so they hit it off over baseball. <laughs> That's awesome. Any other responses? Also say that if you have family um, and they know that you're gonna have an interview, make sure you warn them not to like jump in. <laughs> kind of set the stage that way in preparation and even though sometimes you know the kids can add some to the conversation it kind of derails a little bit because then the focus then you get unfocused and they get unfocused but just you know make sure you let your family know during this time try not to come into the to the room or whatever to when i'm doing my interview I'm just going to check the chat and see if there's any questions. It looks like so far we just have one, um, two questions. Um, I think I'm going to start with a question that was given to us earlier in this evening from Aurora. When looking at applications, sometimes they, oh wait, hold on. That's not the right one. I'm sorry. So many. Okay, here it is. If the current situation makes us delay getting a job or into grad school, do you think employers would hold it against us? So Melissa, I, I actually just sent a response on the chat line, but I would say, I almost want to say it depends, but I, I definitely during this situation, I would not hold it against them. Now, if we were to see uh, consistent gaps in employment, uh, you know, where they held a job for one year and then they had a one year gap or a two year gap. That might be something that we take into consideration as we review their resume or their application. But again, um, especially during this situation, I think that everyone is keenly aware of, of the hardships that it may have caused. So I can't say I would hold it against them, but I, I did follow that, follow that up with have an answer prepared if you're asked you know, have, have a thoughtful answer prepared as to why uh, there might be this gap. Anybody else? There was another question that came in that probably was pertaining to the last um, question regarding virtual interviews and it's, can a background be too busy? So yeah. for going back to a virtual interview. Can it be I too? Busy. Yeah, it might be. Yes, a conversation starter and distracting. Yeah, so you kind of have to make good choices in, in your background. Just like, you know, if my shelf is very messy, that's why I have a little shelf cover there. <laughs> Must be talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm at work. Organized. <laughs> no, no. Um, wh one thing I, I agree with John with that last question that you had um, um, for the candidates. It, it is, we do ask the gaps and you do have, why was there a gap and we don't hold it against them. We do have a concern about it and we'll talk about it and we'll ask the question. So be prepared to answer. So I was just gonna validate what John said. Great. And um, I, as far as the backgrounds on the videos, I think I would be really cautious about what you select. There's a number of good Zoom business choices and I would stick to those. I wouldn't go into, you know, you're on Safari or you're in the Northern Lights or whatever. This isn't the time to distract the people with your background. It's the time to have them not really focus on the background, but focus on you. So this is a great opportunity for that to happen. What type of questions do you like to hear from candidates at the end of an interview when asked, do you have any questions for us? You know, I, one that comes to mind is, um, you know, are you um, happy working here? You know, do you enjoy your job? What, what are the best pieces of your job? How long would it take me to get um, into you know, an opportunity, if I get this job, what's my career path forward? What could I expect to see in say five years, 10 years? Because I'm looking for, um, I wanna to commit to an organization, but I would like to have a commitment back. And so is there an opportunity to be trained and developed? 
Um, do you have in-house in, in training programs? Is there an opportunity to train for succession planning so I can be ready for future positions? Um, and it shows initiative, it shows curiosity, it shows a commitment to the organization. So things of that nature would be, would, would cause you to go, oh, okay, so they're thinking about this. So along that same line that Brenda talks about is um, the idea, someone asked me once, it's like, how did you get to where you are and do I have a path that way with your organization, right? And so sometimes, you know, those are very deep questions, but it does show that someone's thinking about their future and being invested. And so those are good questions is how did you get to where you are? Because one of the questions I ask um, um, our candidates is, tell me about how, how, who made Renita who she is today? Who's made the impact and why? And talk about the mentors you've had in your life. So it gives, when they turn it back on me or when someone asks me that, then I, I go into how did I get to where I am? And so when Brenda shared her story today, you know, um, and, and her curiosity, you know, you get excited about those things. So I think those types of questions are very insightful. And I enjoy that because it opens up a whole new realm of conversation as to who you are as an individual. Also, um, I think, uh, well, personally, uh, personal experience, my boss likes to know, um, you know, if I, if I have a roadblock or something for my projects, you know, if I ask, uh, if uh, during the interview or you know when, when, during our meetings, what kind of support or resources available for me to um, be successful, rather than being stuck in one place? And also, I was ask him. Uh, I remember during my interview, I asked him his personal experience. You know, uh, what kind of support system or resources he had uh, when he faced challenges. Or sometimes I, I ask, so, um, as an organization, what what are the challenges that they're uh, uh, facing, you know, they're expecting to face, and how, uh, what, what are the options, uh, you know, to go around the challenges. So I think for me, it's important to know if I'm going for a job interview. John, John mentioned something in chat, which is anything that shows that you've done some research into the organization. And I had an applicant come in for a very high level position, but she had gone to our budget book. She had gone to our, um, our all the county, um, the, the different operations. And so she had paired the budget with the new product that we were looking to buy as a system and with how many people we would have to be putting onto that system. And she developed a number of questions with that as the backdrop for her questions. So we were extremely impressed that she knew the budget for the project. She knew the budget for the department or divisions. And she had an idea of how many people were working there and what they're currently assigned to do. And she came with a plan for what she might, um, how she might redesign it a little bit to make it more effective or efficient. So that was pretty exciting to have somebody come in and basically have a, um, a project plan that she presented during her interview. Tracy also put something in the chat that's always a good question to ask, and that is, what does your department hope to achieve in the next couple of years? And that's a good open-ended question. A um, couple more. There was another question that came in from Michael. If you could go back to when you first started your career post-graduation, is there any one piece of advice you wish you could have given your younger self? It's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question for the interview, too. <laughs> You know, I would say follow your passion um, many times, especially when we're also sharing with uh, alumni at some of the uh, mixers. We talk about, you know, every um, microbrewery needs an accountant, uh, needs a, pro a project manager, uh, you know, so um, you may graduate with a degree in political science and, um, uh, you know, Brenda went ahead and, and parlayed that into a, a legal uh, degree as well, but often it was, you know, oh, you're going to become an attorney or you're going to teach. And I think we've demonstrated here, there's a few poli-sci graduates that have paired off into different career paths. And so I would just say, 
um, open your mind uh, and use your skill set for something that you're passionate about. And take advantage of the company's 401k plan immediately. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told my son when he got his first job a couple of months ago. That's right. <laughs> Rich dad, poor dad. <laughs> yep. um, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll throw one thing I wish I would have done uh, and not listen to the advice of some counselors I had in high school and junior college. You know, they said if you're going into science, you need to take German. I would, I would have been much better off taking Spanish. And um, and I had to go back and learn Spanish for several jobs, or at least enough rudimentary conversational Spanish. So that that's one thing I wish I would I would have would have done back, even started in high school. So a second, uh, you know, be at least somewhat fluent in a second a second language that you use, not just something that's maybe you might use, you know, or maybe you won't. So anybody else? I just want to say this, uh, no matter how you look at it, the thing that is going to be helpful for you is use the mentors, use people out there that you can rely on <clears throat> to help steer you in the right direction. Because uh, when I, when I drastically changed careers, uh, I had conversations with mentors and, and, and having mentorship, uh, not just now but throughout your life will really pay off for you i'm going to try to find our link to the mentor program and i'll put that in the chat for you too if i could find it. i should have it memorized but i don't um any other advice before i move on to another question um this is a great one, and especially for those of us who are trying to work from home and balance everything. And the question is, how do you balance home and work life while working from home? Oh, that Someone line, has to have the answer to that. That line is blurred. <laughs> I did want to share, um, I dropped them in the chat, but I think self-care is very important in, the, in this aspect because we wanna be able to disconnect. Sometimes that's very hard um, to be able to um, disconnect and take care of yourself. Um, so whether that's physical or um, mindset, to so be able to meditate, whatever it is, I feel that self-care is very important in that aspect, um, along with organization. So you know, keeping in mind that whatever notebook we need for work, we keep that all in one location. That way we don't um, you know, mix up work related with uh, school or any other duties that we are doing. We yell at our kids and say, don't you know I'm in a meeting? Uh -huh. <laughs> <That's okay>. Right. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you put a sign on the door that says from eight to five, I'm working. <laughs> don't ask me what's for lunch. John put unplug, make time to get outside and see the sun. Ooh. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I yeah. wish I could see our, I wish I could see some of our, um, our um, attendees on this so we can say hello to them. Even if you're not video ready, I think it would be great to see you guys. You know, I would say this too, and there's been so many silver linings through this process. I know there's been some difficulties for sure but take advantage of those opportunities. Take advantage of the flexibility um, that you may have. It, it just a change in environment. Look for those opportunities to, um, you know, take 15 minutes to read if you, if you were in an office setting where that wasn't available. Um, but then also set boundaries with either your staff or your teammates. Um, you know, it's one thing to receive an email at eight o'clock in the evening, but if you're often responding to those emails, well, then you've set the precedent that you, you're available to answer those emails. And again, you have to balance that with uh, the type of um, career that you're in. But again, um, yeah, that, so take advantage of the opportunities and, and set boundaries where you can. A while back, I did um, legal work for my own firm, and so I had my own business 
office and I operate it out of my house. So the lines are instantly blurred between your personal life and your work life. And the hours were long. But one of the things I made it a practice of doing, and somebody said, get outside and see the sun, I would start at least three days a week with a hike. And the hike would be, you know, maybe I'd be out there by seven, and I wouldn't get back home until nine. So that was about five miles. And I clean up and then I would start my work. And one of the things I realized because I didn't have a dedicated employer, I had clients. My clients, I could schedule to begin at you know, 11. And they didn't know, you know what I was doing in the morning. It was really not their concern. But then I would make up for the time at a time when I couldn't hike, which might be in the evening. It might be too dark or too you know, treacherous, I don't know. And so I, I figured out different things I could do to make sure that I had that release valve on all the pressures of the work. And for me, hiking was a great way to do it. I like the outdoors. I like trees. I like grass. I sometimes saw small and large animals. So it was exciting. And so um, find whatever that is. For me, it's hiking. But find whatever that is for you. It might, you know, mean meeting people for coffee at you know the coffee shop you know and and you just have a half hour with them to sort of unwind or an hour um it could mean that you do something at a gym it could be you know whatever it is and but it's super important that you do that and with family it's also um important that you for remember this the other day it was just this week and I took off midday to go be with my daughter for a medical appointment and watch her two kids because she couldn't bring them in due to COVID. My work will have no recollection of what I did in those two hours even next week. If I didn't do it using work as my reason not to be with my daughter who's getting scheduled for something very serious, she would remember that for the rest of her life, that I wasn't there for her. So. It's important that we have our careers, but it's also very, very important to not subordinate everything else to the career because you will end up suffering in the end and, and losing what's really, really important and valuable to you. So um, make sure you figure that in your balancing as well. Melissa, one other thing I would share, work-life balance is so important. Uh, and especially when I was in retail, you know, retail kind of has the, um, uh, underpinnings that you know you live that life um, I would share that when you have the opportunity and you become the manager um, keep in mind that your team your staff is feeling the same pressures that you're feeling and so when it comes to work-life balance uh, I often remind my team especially now I'll ping them every once in a while and ask them, what, how's your garden look like? You know, I know they like to garden or they like to cook. How, what have you been cooking lately? Um, and that lets them know as well. And, and I share with them, you know, take an hour here or there um, and letting them know that you're flexible as well as a manager, a lead, a supervisor um, really adds benefits all the way through. Great. I'm just looking to see if I've missed any other questions in the chat. Some really good comments. Thank you. Well, we could definitely wrap this up. I will give another minute. Does anyone want to just throw anything else out there before we close this down? Hey, you know me. Um, I want to say if people want to, I want to see them actually. There's a Michael I saw a picture, some of our participants. Great to see you, Frank. Thank you for turning on your video, George, Kathy. Well, I mean, I've seen Kathy all along, but I, 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 I love seeing people's faces and how engaged you guys are. So th I think it's a great thing that you guys are taking the time to learn more about how to improve yourself and all of that. Since I can't be with you, but I have these swags, right? <clears throat> it's a reusable, um, reusable bag. If you want to send Melissa your address, so I would be more willing to mail you a little it, it kind of um create it, it goes into this little um it folds into this but it's a reusable shopping bag for so you don't have to pay those 10 cents when you go shopping because i love participation you guys are doing great 
It's good to see you. I hope you all have learned something today. I know I have as a panelist, so it's always important to give feedback on how we can do this better for and help everybody um, uh, in the future and other alumni and other students as well. So thank you so much for your participation and being here. We, we love to do this, right? Everybody, we love to do this. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, great. Yep. Uh, good questions, uh, good, yeah. good answers from all of you. You could send me your addresses privately. You don't have to put them in the chat for everyone to <laughs> Yeah, comment. Send them. I, won't, I won't sell them or share them with anybody. <laughs> um, oh, Jonathan has a question. Yes, Jonathan. Can I, sorry, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I'm on a break from class so I wanted to come and drop in real quick oh, good great for you, man. good for you thank you uh, it's really really great and I my other question was like I've been trying to like with the whole zoom thing going on in virtual I kind of want to put my own kind of background and flavor into it so my question was is my background overwhelming tone it down no I think it looks great it looks great oh, yeah, yeah. That was kind of my thing very because yeah, I, I wanted to kind of put my own flavor in it so I wasn't sure if it was too much no, it looks great. But, but can I get a free swag bag too? Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> send, your, send your address to Melissa, and I'll send. You. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for everything. It's been really great. The little bit I was here, I learned so much. Good. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank I'll you look for your address. All right. Well, I will. Um, while folks are giving me their address privately, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Walt Allen, Renita Bess. Jonathan Farrar, who I realize is in a whole different time zone this evening, so thank you, sir. Um, Donald Henry, Amarani Rivera, Brenda Dietrich, Dean Bui, Hansini Vitharange, Tracy Yao, and John Poli. Um, as you know, this is being recorded, so um, it will be available on our website um, probably in the next day or two. And um, with that, I guess that concludes our event so thank you to all of you thank you guys Thanks, thank you melissa yeah, yeah. thank you thank you melissa for hosting of course thank you <laughs> wonderful and thank you for, to all the alumni and the panel invaluable information thank you so much for taking your time to join us today <laughs> nice meeting you all yeah. have a good evening everyone bye george bye michael bye. Everyone else too. <laughs> you guys, you guys are awesome. Yeah. Bye, Bye, Roman. Thank you for hosting, Roman. Oh yeah, yes, Roman. Kathy. Thank you. Mm. Bye, Kathy. Bye. So good to see you. See you later, Brenda. Good night. Oh, yeah, your daughter's so cute. Hi. <laughs> Bye, Walt. Daughter. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> you guys. Bye. Are I can't leave the meeting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs>